Heavenly Father, again, we're grateful for our time together tonight, uh, for everything that is happening in this building. Father, may it glorify you. May it bless you. May it be the kind of thing, Father, that draws us nearer to you, opens our eyes to your truth and your grace. And tonight, as we continue to talk about forgiveness, to help us understand not only what that is biblically, but how powerful it is. Uh, What an amazing thing we have been recipients of in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. What an incredible thing we've been asked to give as we reflect that in our lives. God, may you open our eyes to these kinds of things. May everything that happens in this place tonight, Lord, be done to your glory and your work in your church. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Got some more folks coming in. We've got some extra copies of things over here. All right, so uh, most weeks before we jump into the heart of what we're going to talk about, I sort of outline one or two crazy things that have happened during the week. I've decided to call it, I've I've officially uh, made this a segment of our Tuesday nights now. So I'm going to call this segment This Week in Woke. So whatever happened this week that was the most woke or most bizarre or most kind of strange, and some of this we're just going to kind of keep our eyes on because a lot of it, you know, is is extreme and and sort of odd to us, but some of it is um, enormously consequential. The stuff that we're dealing with um, does not exist in magical fairyland. It has real-life consequences. So... In this, in this week's version of This Week in Woke, this comes from an article reported in WebMD entitled Remove Sex from Public Birth Certificates, AMA, or the American Medical Association says. So, again, this is a serious group of people handling um, technical medical questions, and this, was what they, uh, this is what they met together to do. And let me read just a couple of paragraphs of this. Robert Jackson, MD, an alternate delegate from the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery, spoke against the measure of removing sex from birth certificates. We as physicians need to report things accurately. Now, that's a nice thing for a doctor to say. Jackson said, all through medical school, residency, and specialty training, we were supposed to delegate all of the physical findings of the patient we're taking care of. I think when the child is born, they do have physical characteristics, either male or female, and I think that probably should be on the public record. And that's just my personal opinion. Now, now notice what this doctor feels like he is in, uh, uh, an atmosphere where that's not going to be viewed positively. So he has to throw it on the table and then back away and say, hey, that's, you know, mm, that's just me talking. During this meeting... Um, this was one of the people who presented and on, on, on behalf of removing um, biological sex or gender from, um, uh, from birth certificates. And to my eye, that looks like a highly professional presentation to make to the American Medical Association. So he's part of a, a transgender group that's trying to remove that um, in order to make people feel more accepted I guess when they're born or after they're born, Um, because you know how infants love reading through all of their um, birth certificates. The next couple of paragraphs of that same article say this, Sarah Ray Smith, MD, delegate from California, speaking on behalf of the women physicians section, said removing the sex designation is important uh, for moving toward gender equity. And there's one of our magical words, equity. We need to recognize gender is not a binary, but a spectrum. That comes straight out of something that's called queer theory, and it's part of the broader spectrum of critical theory. Sometimes it's called critical queer theory, but more generally just queer theory. And this is this position that um, it's not binary, it's a spectrum. All of this has been some form of a cultural construct, white male construct, Uh, biological sex is according to queer theory. Obligating our patients to jump through numerous administrative hoops to identify as who they are based on a sex assigned at birth, primarily on genitalia, (laughs) is not only unnecessary, but actively deleterious to their health. Isn't that interesting? 
Um, nowhere in this article, as I read it, and certainly not in the excerpt that I gave you, did anyone bother to talk about chromosomes? Um, those don't change. Um, but we're talking right about the physical things that a surgery can add or remove. So we, this queer theory is making its way from the academy um, into children's, uh, children's cartoons and now into the American Medical Association and the way the birth certificates are actually designated. So there's... I appreciate that, that she's speaking on behalf of the women physicians. <laughs> I find that a little bit offensive. Yeah, on behalf of the women's, yeah, <laughs> women's physicians section. Yeah, I mean, it's, hmm, yeah. <laughs> um, another article that came out um, that, that made the rounds, and it's, it's an investigative reporting article. This author who runs this website, her name is Barry Weiss. She's famous because she got angry with the woke culture, got fired from the New York Times for doing this kind of investigative reporting. And so now she kind of does it on a freelance basis. Um, so her work is really interesting. And as soon as this came out, um, again, this sort of made a lot of, uh, uh, made a splash. During a recent endocrinology course at a top medical school at the University of California system, a professor stopped mid-lecture to apologize for something he'd said at the beginning of class. I don't want you to think that I am in any way trying to imply anything, and if you can summon some generosity to forgive me, I would really appreciate it, the physician says in a recording provided by a student in the class whom I'll call Lauren. Again, I'm very sorry for was certainly not my intention to offend anyone. The worst thing I can do as a human being is be offensive. Now, that sentence is interesting. You know, someone's making a public apology. They probably feel a little bit nervous and they're worried. So you are prone to exaggerating when you say stuff like this. But that sentence is a perfect reflection of the ethics of this entire woke culture. What he says is right according to this point of view. The worst thing you could do is make, one, make someone feel bad about themselves. We don't want anyone to go through the psychological harm of changing their birth certificate, right? Because that makes them feel bad. So the doctor says, worst thing I could do is to be offensive. So please, if you can summon an ounce of forgiveness, please forgive me. His offense, using the term pregnant woman, I said, when a woman is pregnant, which implies that only women can get pregnant, and I most sincerely apologize to all of you. It wasn't the first time Lauren had heard, and, and these are people being instructed in the University of California system to become doctors. It wasn't the first time Lauren had heard an instructor apologize for using language that to most Americans would seem utterly inoffensive, words like male and female. Why would medical school professors apologize for referring to a patient's biological sex? Because Lauren explains in the context of her medical school, quote, acknowledging biological sex can be considered transphobic. All right, so you're, you're weak and woke. Okay, so this just continues to, uh, it's this domino effect. It continues to, to snowball. So again, it's not just in the academy. It's inside of not just elementary school curriculum, it's actually inside of medical schools and legal schools, and these, these people will be taking care of you when you are in the, your nursing homes, right? So, <laughs> well, if you can just self-identify that way, Pat, then hopefully, hopefully you'll be treated that way. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. <laughs> will, will they know how? Will they have learned the actual know-how of doctoring or will, have, will they have learned an ideology instead? Yes? What if you identify as a jerk? <laughs> if you self-identify as a jerk, that might work. Who knows? <laughs> but it'd be the worst thing you could do, but I mean, if you identify as a jerk. <laughs> then, then who's to tell you you can't be a jerk? Exactly, exactly. I want to see a show of hands. Who here self-identifies as a jerk? <laughs> it depends on the day. All right. <laughs> the, the endless spiraling of this is crazy. Part of, part of what strikes me 
as ironic. Now, I think it's, I think it's just true, but given the way our world has worked for the last 20 some odd years, especially with the push of new atheism and that whole phrase science denier and so forth, who on earth now is in the position of being science deniers? The groups of people in our culture who are preserving scientific knowledge and the belief that science can be objectively true turns out to be groups of people like conservative Christians who not that long ago were told that we were science deniers because some of us don't believe in Darwin's theory of evolution, right? And yet, this point of view has disconnected itself literally from reality for so long now that, man, we are sliding down this hill at a really, really rapid rate. All right, so I give that to you for, for kicks and giggles. Um, our week in woke, and there's some information, and you might have some uh, follow up on some of that if you'd like to. So I want to jump back into some of the uh, theological and conceptual reflection on uh, this whole world of worldviews, this critical race theory, and to continue to talk about guilt, repentance, and forgiveness. There's at least one other concept that I want to pass through the lens of Scripture that is hard-baked into critical race theory and critical theory, um, and how does it actually work with um, the Christian worldview or theology or scripture or how Christ talks about forgiveness. And as we get there, I want to remind us of a couple of really important things. We dealt with this last week, but I want to kind of touch on it a little bit more before we get into the specifics you I want to talk about tonight. Let's recall that wokeness, this point of view, combines what that activist last week, that activist who came out of this worldview, she found it so unsatisfying. She couldn't find restoration or forgiveness. And she said what it does is it combines infinite guilt with infinite responsibility, and it's unsolvable. You can't fix that. There's no forgiveness there. It's Christianity without mercy is what she said. And more and more people who read these folks and interact with this ideology and put up with this ideology are saying the same kinds of things. It's guilt and shame heaped from one group upon another, and there's no way of getting out from underneath it except under extreme conditions. We're going to read one author, a white pastor, who believes that it's his job to continually repent for white sin and the sin of white Christians. And he can't find a solution for it, but he's constantly repenting of it. So there's this sense of a certain group of people, especially whites, especially white Christians, are in this perpetual mode of self-shame and repentance, struggle sessions, um, reparations. We talked about reparations last week. There are only these really extreme ways to answer the question, and even then the answer forgiveness really isn't dealt with. We read a section from Moss Guinness's book, The Magna Carta of Humanity, last week. Here's one more piece of his book, something else that he says, touching on this issue specifically. And by the time Os Guinness gets to the end of this book, he's had plenty of things to talk about with both um, right and left sides of politics. But man, he just, um, he, he just, he just he, you know, as some pastors say, he brings the fire when it comes to the last couple of his chapters. And he, he has nothing good to say about what he calls the progressive left. So that's what he's referring to as the cultural left. The left constantly castigates its enemies for their flagrant sins, such as racism, sexism, and homophobia, but it offers no mercy and no forgiveness. There is no way back from any of their sins. To anyone charged with one of the left's deadly sins, the agitators in the social media mob are ruthless. They mete out instant convictions in roadside sentences with unsmiling severity and hurry the hapless victims toward Madame Guillotine with summary dispatch. Unless, of course, the accused is one of their own, in which case they are spirited to safety. Right? So just, bam, we're going to get rid of these people and we're going to get rid of them quickly unless you're on the in crowd, right? And then we're going to deal with you in a very different fashion. Thank you, Al. I didn't mean to call you during service, Al. I apologize for that. (laughs) 
There you go. Everybody, everybody checks their phones. Good job. So this worldview assumes, we've, view, we've run across this phrase a couple of times, but it assumes the truth of what it calls systemic racism. Now, again, it's one of these magic phrases. Systemic racism is one of these magic phrases that sounds as if it's everywhere. If we just open our eyes, we can see it everywhere. We can pinpoint it. We can point to it. We can say, this is that, this is that, and this is that. And then as soon as people go, well, let's, let's look at some of the data and the trends and the facts, a lot of the systems that are supposed to be racist, that doesn't really follow through. And so the term doesn't refer to a lot of systems. What it refers to is a history of racism in the past and corroboration with past history by having a certain skin color now. So you get this language a lot. So Phil Steiger benefits from white oppression in the past. Therefore, I am a white oppressor and am unconsciously involved in perpetuating systemic racism. That's the kind of logic, that's the kind of language because of the color of my skin and some supposed background, you know, three, four, five, six, seven generations ago, I am now unconsciously racist because I am participating in the fruits of white oppression and supremacy in the past. That's what's meant by systemic racism, okay? So when you start going towards specifics and those specifics don't measure up to the phrase systemic racism, we go into these very generalized kinds of descriptions. Now, part of the weakness of this ideology is how it reacts to criticism. When you go after it and you ask actual questions or you go after actual data, and then the way they respond to criticism helps us, if, if we are sharp thinkers and we're aware of things, helps us see the weakness of the position to begin with. Even if someone wants to offer an alternative solution to genuine injustice in this world, but that solution does not fit neatly inside of the critical race theory bucket, that's dismissed as white oppression and colonialism and racism. You have to fit into a particular cubicle, a bucket. Everything you believe fits in that bucket or you are a racist. Now, again, you might think that this is Pastor Phil deciding to get grumpy. Um, Christianity Today uh, published an article by a Wheaton professor. His name is Esau McCauley, and he's a really interesting dude. He wrote a book recently called Reading While Black, and it's an entire hermeneutic of interpreting Scripture um, through um, some version of, of a black background or black heritage, okay? Um, so he writes this article just about a week and a half ago in Christianity Today, and here is some of what he has to say. The church, and he's speaking about, um, what's the title of this again? The church's, uh, the church's focus on critical race theory is, um, there it is, a CRT debate distracts from God's justice. So debating CRT distracts from actual justice. That's the, that's the uh, headline. That's the title of his article. Here's part of what he says. The church had an opportunity to lead in this area and show the world how our faith allows us to press for better treatment for all. Now, here's how, this, here's how these kinds of articles and books work. There's a lot in it that you're going to go, all right, all right, I'm okay, I'm, I'm down with that. But then it gets a little bit more specific, a little bit more detailed. You ask a couple of what do you mean by that questions, and I don't like it. <clears throat> Instead, some decided to litigate the validity of critical race theory. With black and Asian blood drying on the concrete streets of American cities, some, and notice the emotionally evocative language there, some decided to debate the existence of systemic racism. They did not look at the thing itself. Instead, the thing itself became the occasion for a tired dispute, which, by the way, he helped perpetuate. That debate revealed how portions of the church were ill and in need of healing well before the airborne contagion made its way into these shores. These sick parts of the body of Christ told us to, quote, just preach the gospel. 
So, if you disagree with any of this stuff, you are part of the sick parts of the body of Christ. If you think that the gospel is actually a pretty powerful thing and can do some pretty amazing things in the lives of people and inside of systems of people, then you're just part of the sick group of the body of Christ. Now, the article is short, and it goes on to say several more things like this. In articles like this, get under, I, have to, I, I, have to, I have to hold myself, because it gets under my skin. I have to get over this, but they get under my skin. Um, because this, this, is an, this is, was a headline article at CT Today for a couple of days. Um, so it's one of the articles that they're, they're telling us about, about them as much as they are anything else. So one of the mistakes made by authors like this and articles like this is a mixture of these logical fallacies and this kind of emotional manipulation. You can feel inside of just these two, this paragraph in one sentence, you can feel some of that sort of emotional manipulation. There are these dying bodies on the streets and you're just not paying any attention to them whatsoever. He goes on to talk about um, Asian discrimination, but doesn't talk about who's most responsible for the beating up of Asians in the streets. He doesn't do that, right? So emotionally evocative language, and if you disagree with him, you're sick. So it makes a lot of mistakes. These kinds of articles make a lot of mistakes. Let me see what we've got going on here. Some of those mistakes are things like gaslighting, guilt by association, and false generalizations. So what is gaslighting? If you learn what gaslighting is, you will understand what's happening in our culture more than you have understood what's happening in our culture at all. So gaslighting is what happens when person A does something rotten to person B, and person B gets upset and reacts to person A. But person A is able to make person B feel like the guilty instigator and the one who is responsible for everything that happened originally. Okay, so that's gaslighting. So what this guy does in this article is gaslighting. All they wanted to do is talk about critical race theory. So he's just saying, it wasn't our fault, it was your fault. It wasn't the fault of critical race theorists, everyone who disagrees with us, it's their fault. Guilt by association. Um, all churches are the same. All white churches are the same and have been the same throughout all of American history. And these false generalizations are the same kinds of things. Inside of this article, he doesn't admit the possibility of people who hate racism and also think that CRT may not be the answer. He doesn't admit the possibility that there are smart people who hold both of those beliefs. I hate racism. And I also think CRT may not be the answer to our problems. He lumps every church into the basket of sick, sick parts of the body. He accuses all of them, and he's accusing, by extension, guys like me of just wanting another red scare. But then Scripture has plenty to say, plenty to say, about what's wrong with hatred of another person, but is able to completely avoid the mistakes of CRT while talking about it. 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 and 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Well, there you go. <laughs> Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. You're abiding in the truth of the kingdom of God. The spirit is at work within you. But that's not the case if you hate your brother. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brothers in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Scripture can speak clearly to hatred between people without falling into all of the traps that come along with critical race theory in everything that it has to say. So if we've been talking, as we've been talking about forgiveness, I want to make sure that we kind of land on this just a little bit. This, this to me is, again, so important. We mentioned this last time that I'm hopeful that through viewing the forgiveness of Jesus Christ through this lens, we will see the forgiveness that we have been given, we've been asked to give in a new light. 
maybe even a deeper, more powerful and profound light than we have ever seen it before. Forgiveness is this powerful kind of cure to these sorts of things. It is powerful and it is completely unnatural. It is not natural to our sinful selves to forgive the way that God has forgiven us. We don't want to do that. What is natural to us is some form of retribution. What is natural to us is some form of, well, they have to do this first and then I will forgive them. Okay, That's what's natural to us. It's not the kind of forgiveness given to us in Jesus Christ. The forgiveness that's given to us in Scripture is forgiveness that releases both the perpetrator and the victim. It releases both the perpetrator and the victim. And keep that in the context of how Christ forgives us. Well, let's talk about what we mean by that. Forgiveness releasing the perpetrator and the victim. A perpetrator, on whatever scale of awfulness you want to put that, the perpetrator can always fix what they have done, make things right, and then we can move forward. A perpetrator can't always restore what they did wrong. But what forgiveness does is it releases the perpetrator of that debt and allows for a way forward in that relationship. Sometimes the perpetrator's not even repentant, but forgiveness on behalf of the other person at least begins the opening of that door, the releasing of that debt, the possibility of moving forward with relationship and trust and reconciliation, right? That's just the beginning of all of those things. So it releases the perpetrator of debt. What has happened to you and me in our sin when Christ, while we were still dead in our sins and trespasses, forgave us? He releases us of that debt. We can't make it up. We can't fix what we've done wrong. So Christ fixes what is done wrong. And then we're asked then to turn around and learn how to give that kind of forgiveness to others. So from my perspective, any Christian teacher or author who maintains a version of historical white guilt just does not understand biblical forgiveness just doesn't understand how it works. Unforgiveness, on the other hand, blocks the way forward, even if there's genuine repentance. Now think about that for a second. Let's say the perpetrator of the harm or the evil is genuinely repentant and is ready then to do whatever they can to rebuild, to restore, to fix, to give back, but the other person harbors unforgiveness that blocks the way forward, even if someone is willing to say, let's work on this. I know that what I did was wrong. Let's work on this. If the other party holds that unforgiveness, the way forward is still blocked. And so unforgiveness holds the victim's heart in this prison of ever deepening bitterness. It's very easy to go down this path as I keep reading on, on some of this stuff, uh, you, you run across historical names and figures a lot. The, so, some of them are the same names and historical figures, but Sigmund Freud. So apparently, one of Sigmund Freud's favorite sayings was, and this is the kind of thing that, that I in my flesh would say, okay? So I, I get this. One of his favorite sayings was, one must forgive one's enemies, but not before they have been hanged. Right? <laughs> what needs to happen first is they should die. Then I'll think about forgiving them. And this is from, you know, Western Europe's psychologist, <laughs> psychiatrist. But how natural is that? How human is that? I will not give forgiveness until I have received every ounce of retribution I think I can pull out of somebody. So now, talk to me about white guilt. Talk to me about white struggle sessions. Talk to me about white oppression. Talk to me about historical systemic racism that Phil is still guilty for because he has white skin, okay? I will forgive you when you're dead, 
when I've extracted everything out of you that I possibly can. Again, it's, it's a miss. It's an absolute miss of the power that there is in biblical forgiveness. And then demanding repentance for deeds not committed by an individual means that actual forgiveness may be actually impossible. There may be some form of of reconciliation between individuals, but that historical past caused by other people has neither been forgiven nor repented of because those individuals are not involved, okay? Now, I'm, I'm not against groups of people righting historical wrongs and pulling themselves back together again when they were divided by historical sins. The Assemblies of God has even done those kinds of things with the denominations that split from the Assemblies of God in the early 1900s. I'm all for that kind of thing. But to believe that that is some form of forgiveness and repentance misses, I think, what's happening biblically. So I ran across another Another book here, and I love these, these puns, white awake, right? You're, you're wide awake if you're white awake. Um, written by a pastor. His name is Daniel Hill. This is published by University Press. Um, he is, I, I verified it, he is a white guy, so just uh, kind of know what's going on there. But, um, and I've read, I've, read a, I've read a chunk of the book, not the whole book, but a chunk of the book. And here's part of what he says. And it's interesting where this sits. He's in, inside of this chapter, he's talking about how individual relationships between white people and people of color work. And he says that when white people try to make friends with people of color, they need to, they need to begin that relationship with the conversation of how their whiteness causes oppression upon this person of color. So he empties friendship of what we would call friendship, and he fills it all in with this whole matter of whiteness and oppression. So white people can't have friendships with people of color until they have dealt with their own white oppressiveness. Okay, so he literally says this stuff inside of this chapter. Here's part of how he processes it. That's why I so regularly and comfortably repent for the sins of white Christians, both for mine and the sins of my community. I repent all the time because I believe I'm surrounded by the sickness of racism. Maybe he is. I see the sickness in the ideology of white supremacy. I, 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 if I stop at every, every phrase, we're never going to get done. I see the sickness and the ideology of white supremacy and that have no doubt and have no doubt that it has infected me. I, I think I would know that, especially if I'm a person who describes himself this way, who believes that this is a spiritual discipline and I need to be hunting my heart for this sin. What he means is I'm white. Okay, that's just, that's just what he means. I see the sickness in the narrative of racial difference and have no doubt it has infected me. I see the sickness of systemic racism and have no doubt that I contributed to it in ways I'm not aware of. I don't know what to do with that. But when you say something like that, it opens the door to what that activist told us last, last week. What is that? That's infinite guilt and infinite responsibility. It opens the door to that. I'm surrounded by sickness and I am sick. I am in need of the great physician. It's the only hope I have to be healthy. And man, I mean, those last two thoughts are exactly right. But the question is, what do you mean by that? That's also why, that's also why I see repentance as the single most important spiritual discipline associated with cultural identity development. What does he mean by cultural identity development? That's quite the phrase. Here's what he means by that. I would even say that it's the single most important spiritual discipline for finding white liberation. So it's just white, 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 white. This new vision of repentance blows up the self-righteousness grid and brings forth liberation. I think the old version of forgiveness blows up self-righteousness and liberates me in Jesus Christ, okay? And then he finishes this little section with these these kind of um, punchy sentences. 
Now, we no longer have to base our cultural identity on an association with the good group, when in fact, the ideology that he holds to does exactly that. Now, we no longer have to base our cultural identity on a rejection of the bad group. Those first two paragraphs were rejecting white people. Okay, so that's exactly what his ideology does. Now we, have no, no, we no longer have to worry about proving, earning, or achieving acceptance. We talked about this last week. All of it is works righteousness. All of it is works righteousness. So those three conclusions to his ideology are precisely the opposite of what he just said. Does, does that make sense? So he's, he's got it all the way around, turned around. Now take that vision of what it means to relate to someone who has a different skin color than you do, right? Or to be in a constant mode of repentance for things that I am sure that I am guilty of, but I don't even know what they are. Take all of that and we, we think about this. We oppose that to the biblical vision, 1 John 1, verses 9 and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Individuals or groups. If an ideology says there's a group of people who have not sinned, it means God is a liar. I think I saw a hand. I'm not sure if I should call, but go ahead. <laughs> That's right. Hey, I'm the one on the video, so you're... Yeah. Yes, because of the color of his skin, he carries his guilt around with him. And this is, the one of, this is, this is one of the reasons why we believe, well, why we believe racism is so, such, a, such a terrible sin. Is it just because of some, the color of someone's skin, we believe that there's something wrong with them? And what he has done, and he, you know, he's just emblematic of this entire system and a lot of Christian authors that say, just because of the color of my skin, there is something wrong with me. This is just another version of racism. And you're right, you can't get rid of this. You can't change this. Um, unless you're the NAACP director for the Northwest region and your name is Rachel Dozial, and you go to a tanning booth often. If you don't know that story, you can look up that story. She identified as African-American and she was as white as me. <laughs> right? But this is true. You carry that around with you all the time, which is why you cannot get past this. Yes. Which is why I believe it is in direct opposition to the biblical version of forgiveness, guilt, sin, and repentance and forgiveness. Now, as a result of this kind of thing, and here's, here's where I, I want to get, because I, I, think this, I think this is just, to me, this is one of those things that I was, as I was going through this stuff, that just a bunch of the other light bulbs started going on that I don't think had ever really gone on for me before. So um, I've been looking forward to getting to this point here. So as a result of this worldview, okay, of being this pastor who walks around repenting of his skin color all the time and of, you know, th these kinds of things, this kind of worldview, because of this, there is this unresolvable tension to the demand for repentance and the lack of mercy and forgiveness, Right? So there's this unresolvable tension. And we're going to call this tension the scapegoat effect. There's a reason we're going to call this the scapegoat effect. All right, now this citation comes from, and I mean only here, people, seriously, only here. This comes from a French sociologist of religion, born in 1923, René Girard, fascinating dude, who, be, who had this radical conversion experience late in life. And he did all of this uh, study throughout his entire life about religious anthropology. And so he writes a lot about what's called the scapegoat effect. 
So he writes this in 1977. So he's not writing this in reaction to the summer of 2020 or, you know, critical race theory in the early 2000s. He's not doing that. This is just what he sees going on in the world around him and how he understands it. And so I, I want to hear this. I, I want us to hear this. The scapegoat effect. What does he mean by this? By a scapegoat effect, I mean that strange process through which two or more people are reconciled at the expense of a third party who appears guilty or responsible for whatever ails, disturbs, or frightens the scapegoaters. They feel relieved of their tensions and they coalesce into a more harmonious group. They now have a single purpose which is to prevent the scapegoat from harming them by expelling and destroying them. That's the scapegoat effect. When this sinks in and you get a feel for what this means, you will see it everywhere. In order for two people to resolve a problem or for one person to fix a problem on behalf of another person, they pick a third party as a scapegoat. They lay all of the world's guilts, ails, and problems, or all of the tensions that exist between those two people, they lay it on the third person. And then they're able to come together with a mutual enemy. And now their only purpose is to get rid of that mutual enemy, the scapegoat. People do this, we do this in our individual relationships constantly. And then massive national and international movements do this all the time. So the scapegoat, the scapegoat is a third party victim. They're perceived as guilty, whether they are or whether they aren't doesn't matter. They're perceived as guilty and guilt is placed on them. And that's how two other people or two other groups of people can fix what they see as wrong. So for instance, for a very long time, pagan cultures would offer sacrifices to appease their gods. So they would sacrifice an animal to reconcile what was broken between them and their God. Um, or even to seal a treaty. So two tribes finally you know, come together after you've killed enough of each other, they finally come together and they'll offer sacrifices. They'll, they'll lay all of that blood guilt on another offering or sacrifice and then they come together. So they're laying guilt on something else in order to come together. Early in the rise of the Nazi party, the Jews were treated as the problem that the Germanic people had and the rest of the world had. So that gave them a lot of the social and economic power to begin to annex other nations, to build a bunch of allies, which by the way, most people don't know this, one of those allies early in the Nazi party was the nation of Iran. So what holds a nation like Iran together with the Nazi party? The scapegoat of anti-Semitism. We all hate the Jews. They're what's wrong with everything, okay? Which, by the way, is still happening. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. And it creates this, if you're successfully able to scapegoat, it creates this strong sense of tribalism in all of the wrong senses of the term. Everyone can now turn the scapegoat into the reason for all of their problems. And they can join forces against the scapegoat. So what it does is it very easily evolves into a drive to expel or destroy the scapegoat so that all of our problems can finally be solved. I mean, what was it the Nazis called their death camps? The final solution? Um, we're laying all of our guilt on someone else and we're getting rid of them. The scapegoat effect um, is universal. This is one of the things that Rene Girard found in his research. That it's, a, it's practice in all religions and in all cultures in one form or another. It's natural inside of our interpersonal relationships and so forth. Why is the scapegoat effect or the scapegoat impulse, why is it universal? Because the human need for forgiveness is innate. We know that there is guilt and injustice, and we long for ways to forgive guilt and to solve injustice. When we do not allow God into the picture, or if we get the gospel wrong, 
like a lot of Christian writers are doing right now, we scapegoat all the wrong people and end up with more problems than we began with. I'll tell you what's wrong with this culture, white people. Yes, you heard, you heard me. <laughs> white people. So the woke and the intersectional crowd has chosen their scapegoat. And the scapegoat is the white guy. It's whiteness. And we've read the passages where they say that whiteness is a disposition of racism. They've just defined it as such. And the first in line to be thrown on the altar to fix all of society's ills are white, heterosexual, Christian males. Those are the bad guys. Even woke Christians view the problems in our society as a result of white Christians, and we heard that inside of that text. And, and guys, that is not uncommon. When you read enough of these articles and books, you read that over and over and over. It's in these Twitter accounts constantly. This phrase, white evangelical, is not a descriptor. It is an insult, okay? It's just the way that it works now. And the questions about whiteness and white guilt and scapegoating, now remember the scapegoat is perceived as guilty, doesn't have to be guilty, but can be described or perceived as guilty. So the questions are not about actual facts or actual justice, but about the narrative of things like white colonialism and how everything can be explained in those kinds of terms. Okay, now here I'm going to get ready to step on another landmine, but that's okay. Because you, you people are good people, and I disappear afterwards anyway. This is why the Brett Kavanaugh hearings were so strange. Because for one group of people, it wasn't about whether or not the evidence cleared him as objectively innocent or guilty. What was important, and this again is in their articles, it's in their language, the narrative of a white man accused of sexual harassment needs to be the only thing that matters. That's why it was so weird for some people to try to figure out what's going on with this. We see evidence, but why is that not what's being talked about in a lot of circles? It's because the narrative is what matters more than facts or what we would consider normal justice. But it isn't just white heterosexual Christian men. Um, white women are thrown under this bus as well, or any system seen as the product of white colonialism, anything that can be labeled with that, including biological sex, including who can have a baby, including two plus two equals four, and again, that's no joke. If it can be labeled this way, then it's kind of flushed down this particular toilet. Then what happens is that when it is realizing that sacrifice, when it's realized that sacrificing these particular scapegoats doesn't actually fix the problem, guess what happens next? We have to find ourselves a new scapegoat. And this is part of what's going to happen in our culture as it continues down this path. It's gonna go beyond just white men who, who are like this and white women who are like this to other people who don't agree with CRT. So you're gonna to begin to see, um, I believe, black heterosexual conservative Christian men thrown under this same bus. Yes. We see this kind of stuff happening all the time. So one scapegoat didn't work, the second scapegoat didn't work, so we have to find another. And it, it just keeps happening because when you, you know, here's the kicker, here's, here's the kicker. When you scapegoat the wrong person, you never find resolution and forgiveness. But when the right person is scapegoated, there's forgiveness and grace and mercy beyond anything any of us can possibly imagine. Scripture has its own view of the scapegoat. I didn't. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. There we go. Leviticus chapter 16. The day of atonement. Lots of sacrifices in the Old Testament. Lots of days of feasts and fasting. A lot of reasons and opportunities to repent of sin and to sacrifice. The day of atonement is the big one. 
Okay, it's the one that's intended to sort of handle unrepented of national guilt and sin. The high priest is the primary one who is involved. Leviticus chapter 16 describes the sacrifice of the bull and what you do with the blood. But it also describes the story of two goats that are involved in the story of the Day of Atonement. So in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, and they drew near before the Lord and, uh, and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come any more at this time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat, but in this way Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for, for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat that shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So we're ramping up to how the Day of Atonement works. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats and one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. So that goat gets sacrificed. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Right now, Azazel is this really interesting old Hebrew word that the ESV, because the way it's translated, just translates the word and gives you a little kind of a note to try to describe it. The NIV, I've given you the NIV version of a couple of those verses. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. All right, a lot of stuff about what you do with blood. So let's go down to verse 20 here in, in chapter 16. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall present the live goat, the scapegoat. And Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all of the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, and he shall put on them put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. So there's a guy ready there to walk the goat into the wilderness. The goat shall bear all the iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free into the wilderness. So the covenant people of God, and we talked about this last time when we talked about corporate guilt. The covenant people of God are having their sins symbolically laid upon this goat. Um, one of the goats has to die and the other goat um, actually has this scarf tied around its neck, this red ribbon, and it's led off into the wilderness and it is the scapegoat. And notice how that works. Aaron symbolically lays his hands on that goat and takes all of the sins of the nation of Israel on that goat and the goat gets to go away. So what's beautiful about this is that as scripture explains this to us, explains this to us that Jesus is our scapegoat. All of our sins have been placed on him and all of our sins are gone away. Christ fulfills all of this imagery inside of the day of atonement. He is the one whose blood is shed. He is the sacrifice that dies upon the cross. He is the one upon whom all of our sins have been placed. He is the one scapegoat that actually works. So he is the willing sacrifice that reconciles us to God and to each other. Wokeness and intersectionality are obsessed with finding different scapegoats. You've got, the, uh, you, you've got it in your notes there. This again from this book, American Awakening. I like the way that he puts this. 
The answer identity politics give is that one group must scapegoat another group to find justice. This has generated a politics concerned with little more than recording who in the book of righteousness is stained and who is pure. A politics in which those who are innocents one day become transgressors the next, but barely the reverse. It means by that, once you become a transgressor group, you're almost never allowed back into the innocent group. I have noted that after the first group of transgressors, heterosexual white men, has been purged, a new group of innocents must step in to take its place. Only if the scapegoat is divine can citizens be relieved of their need to scapegoat other mortal groups, look upon one another as equals, and thereafter build a world together. Only if the scapegoat is divine can we actually be reconciled to each other and, of course, reconciled to God. I've given you some scripture there, thinking about how that works with the scapegoat there in Leviticus chapter 16. How forgiveness works is our sins are placed upon Christ in our acceptance of Christ as our Savior. Listen to some of this, uh, some of the scripture from Psalm 103, verses 9 through 12. Speaking of how God handles these things, he will not always accuse. <laughs> Our world is full of perpetual accusation, infinite guilt, infinite responsibility. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. So let's say all of that guilt is true. Our forgiveness in God means he won't always accuse us of it or harbor his anger forever or treat us as any of those sins deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as far as the outer reaches of that wilderness where the goat dies is from you, far as he removed our transgressions from us. It walks off into the desert. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. Think again of Aaron placing his hands upon that goat. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was both the scapegoat and the one that was sacrificed. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. No perpetual guilt in Christ. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Actually making peace, not perpetual unresolved repentance or forgiveness that can't ultimately be forgiven. He's made peace by the blood of his cross for everything. And then a little bit later on in Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. They are actually there. But what God does is he cancels it. And how does he cancel it? This he set aside nailing it to the cross. Only if the scapegoat is divine is this kind of forgiveness possible. Only if the scapegoat is divine can you and I even be reconciled to each other, much less to God. So this ideology that perpetuates this infinite scapegoating of other human beings just misses the power and the depth of biblical forgiveness of the gospel, the true gospel. This, this, what we're reading now, that's good news. When we read these other people, there's not a lot of good news there. 
There's a lot of vocabulary, but there's not a lot of good news. There's a lot of good news here in this story of Jesus Christ and how he forgives. So here again, I think the gospel is, is better than all of this other stuff, and we need not fiddle with it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful again for this time together tonight and for our glimpse into forgiveness and how we have seen through these last few weeks what it means to be made in the image of God. To stand before you as, as truly guilty, to have sin within us, but then to find the, the righteousness that is given to us in Jesus Christ. And to find the good news of the gospel, the forgiveness of our sins, the steadfast mercy of our God, the one who will not be angry with us forever, the one who will not treat us as our sins deserve, but the one who is made possible through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ, that we can actually be reconciled to you and that then we can turn to our neighbor and not treat them as my problem. We can turn to our neighbor and not treat them as what's wrong, but I can learn to treat them as another person who's made in the image of God, an image bearer, a potential follower of Jesus Christ who themselves can be forgiven of everything. It's a different way of seeing each other. It's a different way of seeing the world. And God, may we in this culture have your eyes instead of the world's eyes. For in your vision of us and in your vision of the gospel and in the work that you've done for us, that is where we find good news. That is where we find hope. And teach us, Father, to be these kinds of people in this world today. In your magnificent, wonderful name, we pray, Jesus.